one of the things that I like to show most of the groups that I work with is uh, this little video that came from University of Kentucky. I know many of you have seen it. It's a laboratory situation uh, that was done in University of Kentucky. There's two potted plants. There's an orchard grass plant uh, that is cut back to like one inch height that simulates a continuous grazed pasture. You've seen this, haven't you, Ruth? Isn't it kind of cool? And another orchard grass plant, potted plant, that was clipped off at three and a half inches of height to simulate a rotational grazing system. So obviously we always talk about leaving minimum grass heights, right? So that three and a half inches would be somewhere close to our minimum four inches of grass height. So then the video goes to like a five day time lapse video and it shows the, the regrowth of the two plants. And you could probably go ahead and hold your applause here till it's over. Okay, so it's just a five, five days of the two plants and watch the regrowth. One on the left is continuous grazed, one on the right has left the proper stubble height. Is that cool? That little short blurb tells a huge story, I think. That is huge. Yes, and you can applaud now. Anybody? Thank you. Thank you very much. That is right up there with Gone with the Wind with my favorite vids, right? Okay? But look at that. What's that tell us? How many pastures, when you're driving down the road on a daily basis, do we see that look like this? 85, 90%? Look what they're missing out on. How much regrowth do we have here? I'm not sure that's totally focused. Is it focused from back there? Okay. How much regrowth do we have on the one inch stubble? Do I need to stand still? Maybe an inch, another inch? So we got five days growth here. That's after this had a chance to rest, if our system lets it rest at all. What have we got here? Four to five inches. Think about that just a little bit. It's the same five days regrowth. They both had a chance to rest, but look how much forage growing opportunity we've missed out on just because we didn't leave the stubble height. And we start talking about prescribed grazing, the prescribed grazing standard, and what we're, we're, we're actually going to do to work with these producers on a grazing system. One of the things that we always have to have, bar none, <clears throat> are we have to maintain minimum forage heights. And right there is the reason, because we're, we're looking at what resource concern? Plant health. Plant health. The other thing is that it's been said, especially on cool season grasses and, and most plants in general, the root system somewhat mirrors what's, what's above ground. So if we had an inch or so of roots below this, and then what happens is that plant, because it has no more photosynthetic factory, there's no leaf surface left. It has to rely on what little root surface it has to start regrowing and draw nutrients from the roots to get this plant started again. And that's the reason it, it took another day or two to get started. So if we leave some photosynthetic factory, um, we also give those, those roots a rest and, and the roots, as well as the, plant, the leaf surface, they shrink up and then they grow. And then they shrink up and then they swirl as we defoliate. Think what advantage this plant would have the root system of this plant over the other.
any of our tall, cool season grasses would be really similar. And even warm season grasses would have the similar pattern, <clears throat> but the startup rate would be a little bit different. And this is one of the principles we're going to start, we're going to talk about when, we, when we're in the forage and livestock balance worksheet, uh, when, we, when we take into consideration the utilization rate. So this, this is just one of the principles that takes place in utilization rate. I, I give this same video to, or this same PowerPoint to uh, producers also, so bear with me a little bit. Um, this forage and livestock balance worksheet it was developed several years ago by um, Brian Peterson, Steve Barnhart, and some others. And when it was originally put out, there were several versions of it. Some of you old timers may remember that. There were, it was hard to keep up with. No, you don't qualify as old timer. Do you remember when it first came out? <laughs> but there has not been a revision for, for a long time. Uh, so the version that we've got on the Iowa website is the version that, ver, version that you can go to, pluck off, and use that one just like it is. Having said that, I've got some plans for some revisions, and I think hopefully we can get, get to work on that. Uh, I've got permission from Grover and Rick Bernard to, to have uh, Jim Phillips help me with, <clears throat> with some updates. But just go to our, our home page, go to Technical Resources, EcoSci, um, EcoSci then go to Grazing and Pasture Management. And, and as you skim down through the Iowa homepage, this may be the most important part in the whole, the whole works. So learn where it is. It's all about priorities, and we all need to know where the pasture management part is, right? When we get to that, then there are several different um, tools that we can use. Uh, last summer, we talked a little bit how to use the uh, pasture condition score. And you can find that tool right here in the same spot also. This is what our, our uh, Iowa grazing plan looks like. Now, every state has a little bit of a variation to the format they use for their grazing plan. Uh, Missouri, Kentucky, and there's a few of those eastern states use a tool that called Graze 4, but Iowa has adopted this forage and livestock balance worksheet, and actually it does a lot of the same things and is very similar in a, in a lot of ways. So this is what we use, not to say that anything that would give us the proper information couldn't, we couldn't use also. The thing about this is, is this is a record of decision, all right? So we're going to record the decisions that you as a planner and the producer make in this tool, but it also can be used as part of the decision maker. It can be used as an analysis tool to, to decide what decisions we want to make. So it's kind of a multi-purpose thing. When you first get to it, don't forget there are, there are written instructions over here on the side. Of course, after today, obviously, you won't need those. Uh, name, age, mother's maiden name, belt size, phone number, all that stuff. Make sure you have it all in there. One of the changes I hope that we, uh, we can make is what I would like to do at some point is when you click on your uh, county, Hopefully that'll, that'll shift us right to the, the soil data material that goes with that particular soil map unit. But right now we're not there. Okay, here we go. We've gone out to this producer's property and he's got his, uh, the system that he's thinking and you and he together come up with the eventual layout of how you think his his grazing system might be. Now this is not a super intense grazing system that I'm using for the example, but we'll kind of follow this, this system through for the day. 
This particular guy had rural water running along the road. He wanted to hook onto rural water, take it out to a central watering facility, so we came up with um, six paddocks. And of course, this is a pond, I don't know how easy it is to see, has gravity flow water behind it. So this paddock has water and this, this paddock waters from the, uh, um, from the building site. So these are, these is, is the discussion and the fact finding in the first um, several steps of the planning process and you've somewhat come up with an alternative, some alternatives. So now we're going to see how well these alternatives work. One of the things we need to know is, and, and probably the, the big key to what this tool does for us is it helps us balance how much forage we're going to grow and how much forage we're going to need. And hence forage and livestock balance worksheet. Now there are several ways to predict how much forage we're going to grow. Iowa has chosen to, to predict uh, by soil map unit how productive that soil is, how much forage you're going to grow. So one of the things we're going to need is how many acres of each soil map unit is in that each particular paddock. Um, so when I'm working with producers, I always go to the web soil survey and I'm going to be going down through that uh, a ne next slide or two. But you guys, of course, can use uh, Toolkit and Arc, uh, ArcMap to do the very same thing. How many of you have used this Iowa Forage and Livestock Balance Worksheet? And so I might call on a few to see how, how you guys do that. And that's about typical. You know, several of us older planners have used it. So this is a, a cutout of that area, and we're going to go in a, a web soil survey to the area of interest. We're going to select, in this case, we're going to go with air, paddock number five here in the bottom right-hand corner. And we're going to delineate that area of our area of interest. And that's, of course, you're going to be doing on ArcMap. It's going to tell us how many acres of what soil type is in that, that particular area. And that's going to help us predict what? How much forage we're going to grow for the season. And that's important, for the season. Season meaning for the grazing season we're looking at 150 days, 180 days. And it can vary and this will help us work with variation. But we're normally looking at somewhere around the 1st of May to whenever corn stocks come available. In this, in this part of the world, a lot of us utilize corn stocks in a grazing situation. So when you, if you have a stock field come open middle of October, Jeff, give or take, then we're going to probably pull them off of this grazing system and go on to the next step. So as we get that information, pretty simple, cut and dried, we're going to look at what's the soil map unit how many acres of that soil map unit in paddock number one and this is going to give us a yield. Now you have to understand that in the makeup, and, then, and this is just a, an Excel spreadsheet, in the makeup of it, it's got the soils and there's always tabs at the bottom. The soils tab is going to give you every tab in the, or every soil in Iowa a few years ago. So Andrew called me the other day and said, well, I've got a soil map unit here that's not in that database. What do I do? And that's a good question because it's kind of an old, old soils list. He had a Y24D or is that, is that Y24D? Those of you in Cass County understand what that means. Productivity wise, it's probably not going to vary from a 24D. So the point is, use what you've got, you know, 24D would be, would be fine. So if those of you that do not have your soils in there, and, and Cass County might be one of the few in Area 4 at least, you're just going to have to come up with what 
uh, maybe another soil map unit indication that that fits the bill for your area. So did everybody hear Lance's question? If you've got several soils that are minimal amount, yes, there's nothing wrong with lumping those together. A lot of times I have the producer with me when I'm filling this thing out, and I remember, I don't know why they were both in Montgomery County, but two different times I've been with the producer in Montgomery County, and we've been working through this thing, and we'll have a predicted yield for whatever's on their pasture. Um, and the soils aren't going to change. That field is that field, right? Unless we, unless we change the shape or size of the paddock, which we can do that too. And we may want to do that. He's got the existing bluegrass. The book says he's going to, and we're going to look about where that number comes from, um, times the acres. Bottom line is that paddock, that 11.4 acres for the growing season is going to produce or predicted to produce 71,100 pounds of forage. Now, there are a lot of ways to come up with that number. Iowa has chosen to um, take those numbers out of our tech guide. There is a school of thought that says we should be getting those numbers from other places. Maybe we clip and weigh and arrive at an annual forage production from a, from a clip and weigh and or a stick, grazing stick measurement and work those numbers through the growth curves to come up with an annual forage amount. One of the things I like to do with that producer when I'm there is say, what ha what's the difference here if we go with your existing forage? What, what's normally the existing forage we come up with, Lance? If we, 80% of the pastures we go out to on the first time, if it's been a continuous grazed pasture, what have they got? Bluegrass fescue. Bluegrass fescue, almost always. Maybe a little Dutch white clover. Yeah. Why is that? Those, those three species can take being overgrazed year after year after year, and that's one of the, the strong points of those species, but, but they're not always the most productive. So what I like to do is I like to look at what the production was for that guy when he was looking at bluegrass, make one click of the mouse, put in a, a tall, cool season grass, brome. How many pounds did we have before? 71,000. Right away, just by improving the forage species, we've made a whale of a change in the production of that, pas that paddock. So that's, that's something I don't know, it, it seems like there's something about that producer seeing that in true life and looking at those numbers that seems to hit home. George's question was, is it, is it easy to interseed brome grass with your existing bluegrass fescue or whatever? Is that yeah. fair? Or any of the grass. Obviously, there's a, there's a technique to try to interseed that. Some people, especially when we're looking at predominantly fescue, would like to start from scratch and renovate the entire pasture. So we want to actually kill the fescue and move forward from there. Or um, we can always intercede into the existing amount. And yes, there are techniques to, that we can look at to do that. But, and we can get into that some other time, George. Where do these numbers come from? Yep, that can, that can be in the tech guide or actually in, out of our soil survey manual probably also. And, and if you go to vegetative, what's it called? Vegetative productivity, vegetative yields, whatever. And there's a, there's a long list of things. And it can give us the CSR. It can give us the corn yield, soybean yield, oats on down the line. And if you go a little further in the table, we're bound down to our our forage yields. Now, take a look at this whole laundry list of forage options that we've got. And you can see by the slide, there's a lot more other options that go with that. So, we, so we've given you a selection of a lot of different forage uh, mixes and recommendations. But what you have to understand is that's coming from four columns from the tech guide. So, for example, 
if we're looking at uh, brome grass alfalfa, or if we're looking at straight brome grass, we're looking at a tall, cool season grass. So if you select orchard grass, we're going to get the very same numbers as our tall, cool season grass. Fescue is going to fall in this category. Brome grass and a legume is going to come from this column. So keep in mind, every one of those selections has to be extrapolated from these four, these four columns. The other thing is, is in our tech guide, these yields are given in AUMs. What's an AUM? Animal unit month. What's that mean? What's an animal unit? Cow, calf, pear, how big? Thousand pound, right, excuse me, yep, thousand pounds. Okay, a thousand pounds. Now that's, that's another one of the skills that at some point we'd like for you, us as planners, to develop a little bit. Um, and we're going to need that number. So <clears throat> we'd, it would be good if we had an idea how big those cows are. One of the things that when you walk out on that guy's pasture is they're always anxious to show you their animals. Almost always they want you to see their animals because they're cattlemen or, or goats or sheep or whatever they're, they're raising. <clears throat> and they're proud of those. So they're going to want to show you their, their livestock. And Wayne's been around a block a time or two or <clears throat> more. He's got a pretty good idea that when he looks at that black Angus cow or that Hereford or whatever, he says, those aren't 1,000-pound cows. They're probably closer to 1,200, maybe even 1,500-pound cows. That's one, of the th that's one of the skills that we'd like for you guys to help work on is a little bit of judging how big those animals are. If you don't know, if that's not a skill you have, ask the producer. They always have a pretty good idea what their, what their cattle weigh, but then you want to take their number and add 150 pounds because they almost always underestimate, okay? So this is a number that says we can grow 10.7 animal unit months on this particular soil map unit, an Ottaway which means it is a mathematical calculation that says um, a, a thousand pounds times how much intake do they do? How much does a cow eat? As compared to their body weight. We typically, right, Wayne says two to two and a half percent. We typically look at a dry, uh, gestating beef cow as somewhere consuming two and a half percent of their body weight. See how, see how important that body weight is? Okay. A, a lactating beef cow um, that's, that's milking, nursing a calf is going to be per, closer to three percent of their body weight. In a high producing dairy cow we're probably looking at three and a half to four, four percent of her body weight that she's going to consume um, every, on a daily basis. So if we've got a thousand pound, pound cow eating three percent of her body weight, for easy figuring, she's going to eat somewhere around 30 pounds of dry matter per day. Now if your, gra or your pasture or your hay contains a lot of moisture, she's going to eat a lot more material to get 30 pounds of dry matter, but the point I'm getting to here is the number we're using in this foraging livestock balance worksheet is a mathematical calculation taken from this AUM and it's going to be given to us in pounds. Okay, pounds of intake per day. Now, if we look at this one, it's given to us in pounds, in tons. Why is that? We've got brome alfalfa and we've got brome alfalfa. Right, hay and pasture, good. The next blank on this worksheet it's called utilization. And the utilization tab on this worksheet I think is very sorely misunderstood. 
I had a, an experienced planner the other day, well, not the other day, probably six months ago, ask me about utilization. And he says, if I go out to this guy's place and he's got this much grass, it, it kind of seems like he's utilized 100% of it. That's not what we're looking at. That's not what we mean by utilization. What we mean, and this is taken right from our Tech Note 32, is the percent of the total annual production that is actually harvested by the grazing animal. Now Rick put his own little spin to that and reworded it a little bit that said a percent of the potential annual forage production, which means, remember that number we were looking at in the tech guide? Uh, I don't know what we were looking at, a nod away, 10.7 animal unit months, okay? That is based off of, of good, good management um, and probably uh, continuous grazing pasture is only about a third of good management. Okay? So we're looking at the, the potential annual growth. We're looking at what percent of that number that was given to us in the tech guide uh, for annual forage production or however we came up with that number, whether we clip and weighed, looked in a tech guide, whatever, is actually being consumed by the the animal. Now this little thing right here is right in the forage balance worksheet and it's always there so it's, it's always there to look at. Now these are numbers that are pretty consistent with, uh, with any of the land-grant universities in pasture countries. So you look at Georgia, you look at Auburn, you look at Tennessee, Kentucky, they might vary a little bit but for the most part, all land grants agree that if you've got a continuous graze system, uh, you're only about 30% utilization. Now what's this mean? We could go to 40% utilization if we had 14, what, 14 days what? We could go to 50% utilization if we had 7 days. 7 day what? You're only on that paddock for seven days and then you move them off and give it a chance to rest, okay? If you're on that pasture for 14 days, obviously you're on it more, uh, longer, and you, you're not taking advantage of a lot of the benefits you're getting with being able to give that, that paddock rest. And that video we saw up front is just one of the things that goes into this, um, into this number the fact that you can capture more sunlight if you don't disrupt the there's, there's a lot of things goes into that number so if we're going to have a grazing system that's got you're going you're to be in that paddock for 14 days and then take them out and let it rest we can plug 40 40 percent into here and I do a lot of extrapolating right there okay my system is not does not hit one of these right on the head so I'm going to pick a number somewhere between how many paddocks did my example have? Six. Where's six paddocks come into this? And how are we going to know where six paddocks come into that? Try to give them 30 to 45 days rest and pick a number in there somewhere. Okay, this, this little formula is taken front right out of our Tech Note 32 uh, grazing arithmetic. And, and if you don't have this, if you don't know this, it's probably something maybe you, you, you would want to write down. Lance said, give them somewhere between 30 and 45 days rest. So let's put 30 days on the top. Let's say we're going to work for, uh, we're going to give them a seven day grazing period plus one. is going to tell us how many paddocks we, why plus one? What's that? You're, you're always in one of them, so this not resting, right? So you've got to add a paddock. So if we take my little example, and this doesn't fit exactly my, my thing, if we take 30 days rest, Lance's suggestion, seven day graze period plus one, gives us 
five paddocks. So if we've got five paddocks and we rotate them accordingly, we can sort of kind of maybe go back to that chart and give them um, the, the appropriate utilization rate for five paddocks. Okay, whether that was 40, 45%, whatever, whatever that was. Make sense? I mean, it's not rocket science, but it's, uh, it's pretty easy. Now, 30 days rest is kind of a minimum. And, that, and we've used 30 days rest um, a lot through the years in planting pasture. Uh, Many of you know Jess Jackson, which he and I were good friends, and we, we uh, agreed on a lot of things. Some things we, we didn't agree on, and that was, the, that was the fun of it. One of the things Jess said, he never plans anything to 30 days rest. It's always 35 or 40 days rest, which probably could be better. It depends on, it goes back to the goal of what you and your producer are looking for. If our goal is to plant medium red clover in that pasture and we expect it to proliferate, if we expect it to um, to reseed itself and, and be productive year after year after year or bird's foot trefoil, the book says you've got to let bird's foot trefoil recover or rest for 37 days in order to, to let it reseed itself and, and stay active in the, in the forage stand. Um, and this, this training is not about programs, but who knows what the equip scenarios for 528 for prescribed grazing go with. Any program people here? What's, what, what are the payment rates for prescribed grazing? And I don't care what the rates are. What's the scenario say? So it says seven days or greater seven days or greater in a paddock, um, you, you come up with the lowest payment rate, whatever that is. If you're somewhere between three and seven days in a paddock, graze period, then you go to the, the second amount payment rate. So this is a way to decide if you're going to be able to, um, to fit into one of those equip payment scenarios. And then we're going to enter, so, so we've come up with a, um, a utilization rate. We've got our forage type. We've got our yield from the soils we've got. And then we've got our utilization rate. Next off, we're going to look at what kind of critters do we have? How many critters? This particular system has, I think, maybe 54 acres. What's a, what's a good rule of thumb for our part of the world for how many cow-calf pairs can we put on an acre? Or how many acres does it take per cow-calf pair? Just a rule of thumb to start with. Two and a half to three. Two and a half to three. Thanks, Lance. I always start with three acres per cow-calf pair. Now, you guys get up in this part of the world where we could get maybe closer to that two and a half. But you get in Ringgold, Decatur, down, down there where the soils aren't quite as productive in your home country, you probably better be looking at three acres for cow-calf pairs if, if we're continuous grazed, if we've got 30% utilization rate. So a lot of times what I'll do is I'll divide the, the number of acres by three and start there as far as how many, how many calves we can put in there. Now the producer's always going to say, well, I've got this many cows. And the good part about this, and as I said earlier, this tool can be used as a, as a decision-making tool, and we're going to decide, are we going to have enough forage or are we not? So I plugged in a, uh, 18 cows, um, calves. This guy had a 100% calf crop, which is a good thing. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. They're not going to start consuming forage until they get at least three months of age. Okay, before that they're going to they're going to be relying almost entirely on milk and nursing. 
and then I put in for 18 and different producers are going to vary some producers will run a bull to 25 head some you know a yearling bull might be 15 head so you're going to have to work with your producer and find out how many bulls they're going to have out there how much does a bull weigh now there's a tough question how this need to be edited how much bull can Dave spread about a ton give or take Eighteen hundred on a on a good day. It's not unusual to have a mature mature bull to be somewhere close to two thousand pounds, and that's another thing you might want to ask that producer by. But keep in mind, where's that number com, is going to come in? It's important that we have about the right number there. Now, as we work down on down through this. This column uh, was added in one of the later versions, uh, and I, I think it's probably something that we're not going to even want to attempt. So let's not even deal with that, that column. Um, and any of you guys that use this regularly, use that column. Very seldom does anybody do it. So we're going to say, let's, let's not even use that. So then we're going to click down here on Tables. And as you can see, there's all kinds of tabs at the bottom. We're going from input. We've been in the input tab all this time. We're going to go to tables. And this is, this is the table that's going to give us, table one is going to show us how much forage we're going to produce. So remember paddock number one, we had 11.4 acres. And at the bottom of the page there, we, we said we were going to grow 119,000 pounds of forage. Remember? On that very first page. And then we plugged in what for the utilization rate? 45 based on 6, 7 day graze period. Okay? Which means we're going to have 45% of 119,000 pounds that's going to be available to that forage. Now, who's, who's got a calculator? Somebody got a calculator handy? Let's say, for example, this guy had this, the very same cattle on the very same pasture, but it was continuous graze system. Um, when we put all the paddocks together, we will have grown 450,000 pounds of forage we're going to be utilizing 191,000 pounds of forage. Take that number times 30% utilization instead of our 45% utilization. So if it was a continuous graze pasture, instead of growing, instead of being able to utilize 191,000 pounds for that season, we'd be utilizing 135,000. Holy buckets! That's 60,000 pounds difference. Is is that huge? I mean, to me, that's huge. Why? Because we bumped this utilization rate. Because we went from a, a five, six paddock system from a continuous graze system where, uh, bingo, we've got an additional 60,000 pounds of forage for that season. That's kind of a big deal. Okay, it's taking that, those numbers and then it's breaking it down into how much forage we're going to grow per month. Paddock number one, what was the forage that we had in mind? What did we pick for a forage way back in the input? Brome grass. So for a tall, cool season grass, um, we're going to grow about 4,300 pounds of forage in April. How do we, how do we know that? Click down here on the utilization tab. And it's going to take you to a table. Oops. It's going to take you to a table in the background that says it's got a list of a lot of the forages, and it's got a list of the months. So what this is telling us is, in the month of May, Rome grass is going to produce 28 percent of its total annual production in the month of May. That makes sense. 
Now, all, all of us that are familiar with those tall, cool season grasses know that the majority of the growth is going to be right here. And you can see that right up there. So the, the majority of your forage is going to be grown in May and June when we're working with the forages we're going to be working with. Just for grins, let's take a look at big blue stem. 5% of its annual production is in May. Where would you expect the most of its production to be? In July and August. It only makes sense. Okay? So that's how the, that's how the worksheet knows that we're getting how much forage production we're getting in April, May, June, on down the line. So then we look at table three, which involves our, our livestock needs. So we're saying in April, we've got 18 cows that weigh 1,200 pounds. Dave, you got your calculator? 18 head at 1,200 pounds at 3% of their body weight is how much per day? 648 pounds we're going to need per day to feed that 18, those 18 cows. And it also figures for your, your calves and your bull, a percent of their body weight. That's why it's extremely important we make a pretty good estimate of what these critters weigh. Because it's all going to figure into how much forage they're going to be consuming. So what this is telling us in, in April, we need 28,000 pounds of feed. We're only growing 11,000 pounds of feed. We're short 16,000 pounds of feed. In May and June, we're producing more forage than we're actually needing. So we've got a positive uh, result there. In July, we're for the most part breaking even, and then we go negative again. Is that a good thing? Do we need to be positive all the way through the grazing season? It'd be a good thing, I guess, if we were. Do we need to be? Don't have to be. Don't have to be. Now, if we go on to the next table, this, for the most part, gives us the same information, except it's broken down in grazing days instead of pounds. So in other words, we're, we're going to need, we're going to grow 12 grazing days, animal unit months, we're going to grow 12 grazing days, we're going to need 18 grazing days in April. A lot of times what I'll do, it, de it depends on the producer's goals, obviously, and what he came in, what he's thinking he's going to do. A lot of times I'll work through this entire input and program until I get to this page, still back on bluegrass. And then, I'll, then, then we're way short of forage. Then I'll go back to the input page tab and I'll plug in brome grass and it'll say, look how much we've gained just by introducing some other, some other forages. If we can go from a 30% utilization to a 45% utilization by adding paddocks, by, by building division fences, look what that 45% did to us as opposed to 30%. So that's, that's a lot of the conversation I have, Dave. I'm not sure that actually answered your question, but um, yeah, I'll, I'll run it through clear to this stage. And this is set up to where we could actually put our, all of our hay crop in it also if we wanted to do that, and it would balance it for that. In my example, I don't have that with us, Dave. But, but what I want to point out, and I think, it, I think you're making the same point, typically, if I see this graph, and keep in mind this is a really good visual. If you did a grazing plan for a guy four years ago, and you go out and do a follow-up with him, this is the sheet of paper he'll dig out from under the seat of the pickup that he remembers from that conversation. This is one of the few things they'll ever remember is this graph right here. But the point is, in my mind, if we've got about as much above the line here as we've got below the line here, we're, so, we're pretty well balanced. What's going to happen to this ton of grass? that we did not consume. What's that? 
Well, exactly. We don't call it stockpiling at this point, but for the most part, for all practical purposes, it's still in that pasture and we're going to consume that later in the season. So if we've got about as much here as we do here, I'm going to call it good. If we're way out of whack, we may have to go back and take out some livestock or make some other adjustments. And I've been with producers that say, I'm going to put this many head of cattle on those acres. There's no way this chart can get us there. It, we might come to the conclusion, I'm sorry, we, we just are not going to be able to do business with you. Keep in mind, to follow our 528 standard, we've got to maintain those minimum forage heights. And we've got to be pretty well balanced right here to be able to maintain those minimum forage heights. Now, if you want to go back to that chart that says grazing days or the chart that says pounds, then you can figure up exactly, yep, I've got enough here to make up for here. And again, as Lance said, or Jeff said earlier, we're probably going to go to stock somewhere around mid-October in this range, in this, in this area. This is a part of this Iowa Forage and Livestock Balance Worksheet that actually balances the, uh, the livestock versus how much we're going to grow. Again, this system goes back to the tech guide that's got yields that have been um, researched by ISU years ago on forage yields and then it goes back to corn, corn yields and CSRs every time they're adjusted. If you would choose to, to clip and weigh, there's a process you can predict annual forage production. What you would do is you would assess how many pounds of forage you have on that pasture today, the day you clip. And then you work it back through those growth curves. Remember that growth curve that said 28% of brome grass is in May? You work that, the number you get when you clip, back through the growth curves and make an annual forage production estimate, whichever style you want to do. I think, in my estimation, this has served us pretty well. Kevin dates can factor into that. Um, excellent question, and I want to cover that. Don't let me forget it when we go back through my other example, because that's one of the things I want to show. One of the things that our, our 528 standard tells us is we need to give that producer an idea how much rest he should have and how much grazing days he should have, and, and this table could tell us that. Next, we're kind of going to a record of decision, so I'm going to go from here to the, the plan tab. This is where we're starting the actual plan part. This is Jim Beam from Timbuktu. I think that's somewhere close to where Flucky's from. One of the things we obviously are going to have to look at here is what the producer's goals are. And as we've been through the planning process, that's, that's one of the things we want to key, key off of. And this gives us an opportunity, I think, to list three, maybe four four of his goals and objectives. It's going to bring these numbers in uh, of those six paddocks that we entered. We've got 53 acres in six paddocks, 18 cows, 18 calves, and a, and a bull. So as you, see, as you can see, this works you kind of write down the list. The next thing in this plan is, is the grazing system, and then we're going to go to the next thing, which is fence. We're going to go to the fence tab. We were here on plan, we're going to go to the fence tab, and it gives you some example narratives. Now I know that in toolkit, you, you kind of want to use the narrative that it's got there for you. Can you vary from it much, Jeff? I don't know for sure. Okay, yeah. In, in this particular uh, planning tool, Pick the one that's closest to what fits your system and then change it. We need to customize this for what that producer's plan is. These are just examples, so you are by no means tied to what, what these narratives say. Start with one and add another sentence or two or three or ten or whatever you need to do. And then what you do is you can just click on that, copy it, 
go back to the plan and paste it in. And then this is where you would you could get in there and type in whatever whatever additions you wanted to make. You could add room. And then you're going to go to the, the water. What have you got planned for water? Click on the water tab and it's going to give you examples for it. Pick out one that somewhat fits your system and again copy and paste it back into the plan. Forage management, same way, copy and paste. Erosion control. Now this is one table in the last page of what this forage and livestock balance worksheet prints out. There's, there's uh, two more tables that goes with this, but this is probably the one that's most important. On other sessions we've talked about what it takes to certify a practice complete. So if Wayne's been working with this producer and he has, has planned a 528 prescribed grazing system, he's worked through this whole process and he said you're going to have six paddocks, you're going to have this many grazing days, we base that off of 30 days rest, um, and we need to maintain these many minimum forage heights. What happens when he brings in his records at the end of the season? He says, okay, Wayne, I'm ready to get paid for my prescribed grazing um, 528. Here's my records. Wayne goes through them and says, you don't have this. Through the course of the season, he doesn't have his 30 days rest. Yike. Where are we at? We don't pay him. That 30 days rest and the seven day graze period are tools that we've given that producer to help him manage plant health. Okay? Those are tools that we've given that producer to help him accomplish what we're trying to produce. This is what's going to tell us if he's accomplished that or not. If it's to, to go along with uh, Dave's comment there, maybe in May and June, when grass is growing fast, the rule of thumb for managing grazing is the faster the grass grows, the faster we move. Okay, So he may be given 15 to 20 days rest in May and June. The slower the grass grows, the slower we rotate. So when you get to July and August, we may be 40 days but for rest or recovery period. Maybe or maybe not we've met that 30 day average for the season, but this is where the rubber meets the road. If we don't have this, that's when we say, I'm not, I, you, I'm not sure we can certify that practice completed. Those other, those other things are tools we give them to help manage this right here. The fall time is a critical time in the health of a plant, of a perennial plant. It's, it's really critical. What we don't want to do, Lance, is we don't want to go into winter with, with something less than minimum stubble height. If we've got a, a brome grass and we go into winter at one to two inches of stubble height, we're actually um, harming the health of that plant. But you said a key phrase there, once there's a killing frost and that plant goes totally dormant, it's not going to try to recover, it's not going to try to uh, pull from that root reserve to try to regrow. So once we've had that killing frost, then we can go ahead and harvest whatever's there. And we're not going to jeopardize the health of the plant. But you're not going to hurt the health of the plant if you if you graze those stockpiled pastures below minimum forage heights. Having said that, we can still manage how well we utilize that stockpiled forage or even the corn stalks as far as that goes. If we turn our 18 head of cows into a 50 acre stockpiled pasture, they're gonna, what are they going to do? They're going to go out there and pick the very best right off the bat. If, if we're looking at corn stalks, I mean comparing that and stockpile, they're going to go, first of all, they're going to get all the corn that's left, okay, 
on the whole 50 acres. They're going to go through and pick out any ears of corn that's, that's not there. Then they're going to start working on the leaves and the, and the husks and the shucks. And then eventually they're going to get down to where all that's left is stocks. We can greatly improve the utilization of even that stockpiled forage or even the, the corn stalks if we just give them so much per day. So in other words, we have to make them go through that entire process before we move them on to the next session. Yes, they can go in and pick out the corn, but then before they're going to move on, they've got to go down through the leaves and the shucks and the stalks on that area before you give them another patch that they can go back with and get the, the better type of forage. We're managing how they, they graze those, that stockpile instead of letting them manage it. Okay, I want to, I want to point out the, the, uh, a few things here that we might want to take a look at. Let's say, for example, uh, that paddock number one was bluegrass when we started, but it had 30% orchard grass and brome, maybe. But in our, in our input page, we planned that for bluegrass. That's just an example, right? That paddock number one. So what that said is, on that on the page before this, it says we can graze bluegrass, Kentucky bluegrass to a two inch double height. But if we have brome or orchard, we'd need a four inch double height. So what this statement is giving us the latitude that we can plan for either the dominant species, which we probably plugged in as bluegrass on the input page, even though there was some orchard grass and brome in that pasture, or we can manage it for the desired species. If we manage it for the dominant species, bluegrass, and we graze it to two inches year after year after year, we're going to determine what the dominant species are. It's going to turn strictly to bluegrass. If we want to try to manage it for the desired species, brome and orchard, then we can, then we've got the flexibility with this statement, we can manage it either way. When the smoke clears, Jeff, we've got to leave the minimum stubble height. So if they can pull them off and, and supplement them, or put them in a sacrifice paddock and supplement, maintain our plant health, then we've accomplished what the taxpayers are giving us the, the challenge to do. But you're exactly right. That scenario happened to person after person after person. They've either lost pasture, or they're trying to increase their herd. But there's a, there's a time when we're just going to have to draw the line and said, I know you want to put 50 head on 50 acres. We can, we can improve the forages. We can improve the utilization rate. We can make 10 paddocks or 15 paddocks or 25 paddocks, or we can have numerous number of paddocks and move them daily or twice daily, no matter what management practices we can plug into this thing we can't get to your to the number of head there's a there's a time where we've got to just thank them for their time and we're not going to be able to help them e even with mob grazing and i understand the the principle of high intensity grazing is a lot different it's not necessarily that we're trying to to keep everything vegetative like we're not trying to utilize some of those plant physiology principles like we do with rotational grazing. But having said that, typically on a, even a high intensity mob graze system, when we turn a lot of cattle into a, into a small pasture for a short period of time, typically the goal they want to keep in mind is they're going to consume about 50 percent of that plant material that's there. They're going to trample about 50% or 25% of the plant material that's there and they're going to leave standing somewhere around 25%. So we still got we still have some stubble to help that plant get restarted again. The only place we can show that and this does have its limitations. It can't do everything we would like for it to do, but the place to show that would be in that utilization rate. We can get upwards of 70-80% utilization when we get into that high intensity move once or twice a day 
situation. And it makes a huge difference. You can stock it a lot heavier, obviously. And this is just another little chart that, that prints out on all those. The bottom line is, remember we were talking about when the grass grows faster, you move faster. So we don't need quite as much rest period. As the grass slows down, uh, we may go from 30 to 40 days rest during the, uh, the hotter summer months. Okay? Not rocket science. Okay. Now, the, the other pages in your handout there is uh, is what I had put to the back of this and is just a blown up version so it's nothing that we need to, to worry about. Lance asked about calves. Do, is it important that we know when their calving season is, when they turn the bull in and out and, and, and that kind of thing? This is pretty much the, sa the very same scenario, but keep in mind those calves aren't going to be eating forage until about three months of age. So a lot of times what I'll do is I'll go to this chart. When, when's a typical time we, we start, past, we start uh, calving around here? And this is, this is another one of the conversations you're going you're gonna to find out from that producer. We could start anywhere in the spring months, typically, and there's a lot of people that fall calves, so that's another thing to enter in here. I think typically for this example, I'm going to say we're going to start in March. Pretty typical. A lot of, a lot of producers are calving right now or a little bit later. So what I'm going to do is these calves... are not going to be consuming forage all these months. How old were they before they started eating? March, April, May. All right, they're not going to go from eating nothing, 100% mama's milk, to full production in that, in that first month, right? So a lot of times on that third month, I'm going to come in here and I'm going to do something in between. Make it somewhat as accurate as we can. Then June, July, August, September, we've got calves eating all the grass that they're, this chart says they're going to eat. When do we wean? Another question you want to ask them. When's a typical time to wean for March calves, cows? October-ish. Don't you think this is going to be a little bit more accurate than what we had the first time? Is this the question you were asking, Lance? And, and I've, I've started doing this. So this is something that you can do to help customize this for that producer. When, if he's going to calve in March, when does he turn his bull out? Aha, uh -huh. this will test you cattle people. June. You betcha, June. So, how long do they leave the bull in? I think a lot of people are going to leave the bull in for 90 days, some 120 days. But the point being, that bull's not going to be, that 1,800 pounds of critter is not going to be consuming this pasture anything but except for those months, right? And you can customize this for, for whatever you've got. So that's going to show up. When you get to this point, the problem with that is, and it's reality, Lance, we've got the greatest need because that's when the calves are starting to consume. That's when we've got the bull in when our forage production is the least. So that's something that we want to keep in mind when we're, we're balancing this forage livestock balance worksheet. This is, this is pretty visual. This, I like this chart because it says, hey, man, we're short of feed. And, and, and Jess Jackson and I didn't agree on much, but, but we did agree that this, these tables were somewhere close, probably within 10% of how, what was reality. And that's a good thing, and I think most people will. And, I, and when they're, you're going to hear, because I've always heard it, um, ah, I'll have plenty of feed, I have for years. 
Well, it's just like when the guy says, uh, I can utilize more nitrogen because I can raise 250 bushel yield. Well, yeah, they did once. And they got through this pasture one year, last year probably, and still met minimum forage heights. But this, this is going to be pretty close. And, and once again, you can always go back to that table before this and say, uh, we've got as many grazing days uh, surplus as we, as we are grazing days short here. You can balance it that way if you want to. You can do it here and say, all right, I'm 4,000 pounds short here. I'm, I've got uh, 31,000 pounds excess here, excess here. Add up your excesses and add up your surpluses and your deficits and see if you can come out. Or you can go to the next table like uh, Jeff suggested and you've, you just have it in grazing days. We've got surplus grazing days or we've got deficit grazing days and you can balance it that way. And this, this table can be as accurate as you want it to be. If you want to plug in, in the input table, if you want to plug in fields that you're going to use for hay, it can build hay, or if you want to, but then keep in mind, we're working with, with the pasture acres here. You're not working necessarily with how he's managing his cow herd, it's with the pasture acres. So when they're on that pasture, consuming forage is what needs to show up here. Now you know everything there is to know about how to do the forage and livestock balance worksheet. You no longer have the excuse that I haven't been trained on it.